Hello, BookTube. I want to do another BookTube type response video here. I watched Owen's channel, Toasty Towns, where he brings up a subject that he has seen on many BookTube channels. This is a subject that's been going the rounds. Uh, he mentions big channels like uh, Murphy Napier or uh, Daniel Green or The Book Leo. I've seen it on uh, lots of other channels as well. They're all reacting to the same thing, which is a GQ article by Barry Pierce in which he laments the effect that book talk and the reading aesthetic online is having on reading itself, on genuine reading. Uh, maybe some of you have read that article. It doesn't take long to do. It's not a long article. And it rehearses problems that even if you haven't read the article, the problems will be familiar. The gripes that Barry Pierce has about book talk will be familiar to you even from just booktube or from your normal life outside of social media, uh, which is that the, his objections to book talk basically boil down to the fact that most of the most popular book talkers are obvious phonies. They are commodifying reading and changing the experience of grappling with a book and letting some author inside your mind change the furniture in your mind, changing, they're taking that experience, which we all know and love, an incredibly personal and private experience, I would argue one of the most personal experiences you can have as a human being, and changing it into a kind of uh, dark academia decorating style, and thereby desecrating it, making it, making it, uh, shallow and fake. Barry Pierce makes a lot of those complaints in his article, says that uh, a lot of those ills of BookTop can be traced back to BookTube. I guess he was a BookTuber in ye olden days and thought that it was more and more fake and phony until finally he left it, pure soul that he is. Uh, and he cites a lot of the things that you will also cite, a lot of the things that are familiar if you watch, for instance, the bigger, more professional BookTube channels like Murphy Napier or Daniel Green or The Book Leo, or if you take all three of those, those, all three of those channels have enormous subscriber counts. If you take all their subscriber counts and add them together, they don't come anywhere near the total subscriber count for Jack Edwards. You take someone like him, you watch his channel, you will see a lot of the things that Barry Pierce is condemning. The rampant shallowness, the idiotic reduction of books to purely surface things. Is your big bookcase color coordinated? Are your unread books wrapped in brown paper bags because you don't want to be tempted by them and you want opening each one of them to be a surprise? How many days did it take you to wrap all of those books? Is, would you have done that if you didn't know that people were watching? Would you have done any of this if you didn't know that people were watching? And by extension, the flip side of that hypothetical question, the question that I ask you to ask about a channel like Jack Edwards, which is, if no one was watching, would you do the activity that you're talking about? Do you actually read? Now, Barry Pierce's conclusion in his article pretty clearly is that he doesn't think any of the most popular book talkers actually ever read. When you're thinking about what that activity actually is, which is that you turn off your phone, which rules out half of them right there, and sit down and quietly, privately spend time reading a book, whether it's a printed book or an ebook. With regards to my nemesis, the demon smurf, Jack Edwards, I have asked you many, many times, I've said many times on this channel, don't go by me. Watch two or three of his videos and ask yourself a simple question. Can you imagine him actually reading a book? My contention is that it's totally impossible. You cannot imagine it. I would argue that that's true of a lot of book talkers too. I'm not, I'm not, condemning Barry, the, some of the points that Barry Pierce's piece makes. I am, unfortunately, condemning some of the points that, that young Owen makes when he rehashes the whole subject. But he's not alone. He's not alone at all. A lot of these bigger booktubers have responded to this article, and I've noticed that the most vociferous responses to a lot of the accusations that Barry Pierce raises come from the people who are actually doing the things he accuses them of. They are actually hyper-monetizing, they're hyper-commodifying, they fairly obviously don't read the books that they haul in gigantic piles every single week, they're fairly obviously not doing what they say they're doing, they're fairly obviously, in other words, lying. Uh, I looked at, I, I mean, Owen mentions three of those big channels, and I thought, well, 
I don't subscribe to a lot of these channels. I, the algorithm suggests them to me anyway, but I don't subscribe to them. I'm not a masochist. There's not, they're literally content free. So there's nothing really that I'm going to be able to learn from them except, well, nothing. They're going to read Barry Pierce's accusations and lie about them because they do them. <laughs> so they're not, they're not going to cop to the game just because he's called them on it. But I thought, okay, well, of the three that Owen mentions, the book Leo is reliably intelligent, as the Dutch tend to be. <laughs> She's reliably intelligent. She's reliably watchable. She doesn't pinwheel all around. I have no idea what Daniel Green, what aesthetic he's going. I do actually know he's going for extremely young YA. He's going for 13-year-old girls, which is why he acts the way he does, like, like an absolutely coke-addled spastic lunatic on this channel. The hyper edits, the weird, dumb, flat dad jokes. That I find his channel unwatchable in a way that I haven't quite got that far with someone like Jack Edwards. But the book Leo, no. So I thought, all right, well, if I have to watch a self-pitying poser like Murphy Napier, if I have to watch a, a pinwheeling spaz like Daniel Green in order to get responses, I don't really want to. I can pretty much guess what their responses will be. But I will watch the book Leo. And in her response video to Barry Pierce's piece, pretty much the first thing out of her mouth is that all the pieces like this can all be dismissed because of the age of the writer. Because, you know, if you're old, in other words, older than 30, you're not going to understand anything that you explore. You're not going to understand any subject. And we already know what you're going to think. It's not like you can do any thinking on your own after a certain age. Uh, I admit <laughs> that ill disposed me to watching the rest of her video. Uh, but I thought, you know, she's she's pushing back against an article that makes some pointed accusations about book talkers and by extension the really successful booktubers about how much they commodify reading, about how phony they are, about how much they're plugged in not to books and reading or to their audience, uh, but to lucrative appearances. So I thought, all right, well, she's pushing back against that and she won't be as unbearable as the other two. So I'll watch her video, <laughs> even though she starts out with what the, the noxious 21st century refers to as blatant ageism. Uh, I would be willing to bet that I'm three times the book Leo's age, and uh, I understand subjects just as well as she does. <laughs> okay, but anyway, uh, I thought, you know, it's a bad opening, but how much, it, the, the rest of the video can't be as bad as that. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, well, it's a smoothly edited affair. You would expect that from a channel as enormous as hers. Uh, she leaves in the stuff that she should leave out. She leaves out the stuff she should leave in. That's just endemic with smooth edits. She leaves in lies as well. She just reflexively, as all these huge booktube channels does, she just reflexively says, well, if, if you have a thought on this subject, let me know in the comments. She doesn't read the comments. <laughs> so well, I, the comment section is another world to her. It might as well be in a different language. Uh, but the thing I noticed the most about her pushback against Barry Pierce's accusations of the over-commoditization of book talk is that her video has not one, not two, not four, but six embedded islands of unskippable ads. <laughs> it is worse than an hour of network television, which had four commercial breaks. Worse than that. It is absolutely choked with unskippable ads. <laughs> I myself alone in just one watching of her video, probably made her $100. <laughs> uh, so you're kind of undercutting your argument that you that you have anything genuine to say. You obviously don't. <laughs> but nevertheless, I watched her video, uh, and she hit... She doesn't do Pierce's argument justice. She dismisses a lot of valid points because she doesn't agree with them. And I kept going back to Owen's video on Toasty Towns. He, of course, has a tiny number of subscribers. Uh, the book Leo or Murphy Napier could lose his entire number of subscribers on his channel and literally not notice. Uh, but he goes back to, I kept going back to his video because he rehearses a lot of points like that. He admits himself that his video is all over the map, but I enjoyed it for that. And uh, one of the points that he brings up over and over again, in fact, he starts with it in the title of his video. He says something like how BookTube and BookTok is changing reading and why it's not our fault. Uh, he goes back over and over again to how this is, you know, if you're, if the algorithm, which is another thing that the book Leo mentions often, but does not indict, 
she says in her video, well, if Barry Pierce only did an hour of searching on Book Talk, in his article, he says that he didn't, and he was on the, the platform. So it's fairly certain that he spent a lot of time, not just an hour. But it fits with her, you know, boomer stereotype about how, you know, you're, you're not going to know your subject when you talk about it. So she said if he did only an hour looking at Booktop, then he would only have seen what the algorithm suggested before the algorithm knows his likes and dislikes. And that there's a lot more complexity. There's a lot of variety on Booktop that isn't visible in that first algorithm-driven hour. That reminded me of almost everybody's first exposure to Booktube, which is the same kind of thing. It's the stuff that the that has pleased the highest number of people in the algorithm's viewpoint. So you will get six or seven channels just like Daniel Green. You will get six or seven channels of, of grown adults acting like antic little children. Heavily over-edited. Lots and lots of jump cuts and jokes and funny faces and funny sound effects and whatnot. The type of thing that will appeal to a 13-year-old girl who's looking for her next online crush, but that will absolutely repulse a, a grown adult reader. They'll look at this and think, whatever this platform is, it's not for me. I'm very happy that I got around that attitude, and I know a lot of people who have and are happy that they found a lot of access a lot of the variety that they like. I've often said that we, the day you'll know that Booktube is successful is the day that it mimics the variety and infinite complexity of the actual reading world. But there's no doubt uh, that the algorithm does favor that kind of mindless content first. And the Booklio brings that up as if that's some sort of exoneration of Booktube. And uh, Owen oh, on Town sort of echoes that and says, both in the title of his video and also in the content of his video, says, well, you know, that's just the nature of the game. That That's that's just the algorithm. That's just the nature of the game, you know? That's not your fault. And in both cases, I, a big booktuber or a little booktuber, I couldn't agree, I couldn't disagree more. Yes, the algorithm is noticing what's popular, but people are also noticing what the algorithm notices and selling their souls in order to make stuff, in order to grab the algorithm, in order to get a big channel. I would argue that that is true, that has long since been the case, in most of the bigger channels that have been responding to Barry Pierce's article. They, the, I would argue that the reason they are so vocally responding is because they are guilty, not because they're innocent. What <laughs> I, I almost want to ask, what possible justification could there be for six blocks of unskippable ads in a video? But I already know that justification, and so do you. And it doesn't have anything to do with books. So, so I think its guilt speaks for itself. The point that I wanted to make, both to the bigger booktubers who were saying, well, you know, you can't judge book talk because the algorithm is going to determine what you see first. Well, what determines the algorithm? <laughs> I wanted to say that to them and also to Owen in his response video, which is, I think, every bit as thoughtful, at least, as the book Leo's, even if it is a little bit scattered. It's certainly more honest. A more of a forthright reaction to what the booktuber in question actually thinks. Once I've seen two embedded blocks of ads on a video of yours, much less six, I am going to end your video by saying, regardless of what you said, I don't have any idea what you really think on this subject. As far as I'm concerned, if you're that many pay grade levels away from me as a viewer, then I have no idea what you think on a subject at all. None whatsoever. With Owen's video, that wasn't the case, but he still made the same point, saying that it's not, you know, it's the algorithm. It's not your fault. It's it's the algorithm doing this kind of thing. And I want to point out here, something a point that I made on this channel before, I know that it's useless. I'm howling into the wind. I know the direction that the booktube area of YouTube is going to take. I'm almost completely certain of it. I think we'll be hearing a lot about that direction today in oral arguments before the U.S. Supreme Court. So I know that I'm howling into the wind just a little, but I wanted to say that, okay, the algorithm, fine, is proffering some material over others. You don't do anybody a service if you don't inquire as to why it's proffering that material, but nobody does. And if you did, then you would, f you would get to the part that is your fault, <laughs> okay? Which is that if you are acting like an algorithm, if you are allowing the algorithm to program you, if you are doing something for it, 
then you are guilty. <laughs> you can't say it's the algorithm, not the people. If the people are trying to imitate the algorithm, then they are to blame. They are guilty. Uh, and so, uh, Barry Pierce, my brother in the periodical world, I wanted to mention that although he's, you know, old and therefore necessarily clueless, a lot of his observations, scathing as they are about BookTube, are accurate. The the blanket dis, you know dismissal that oh well you know you're a boomer so what are you going to know about anything? You know, are the are the observations accurate or are they not? I found them to be mostly accurate. I've spent a good deal of time looking at book talk, probably not as much as Barry Pierce has, but nevertheless not dismissible. And what I see isn't just an algorithm; it's a lot of complicity with an algorithm, a lot of human complicity. So I'm not willing to write this off in the way that Owen is. I'm not willing to say this isn't your fault. <laughs> the people who want to become extensions of an algorithm, it's very much their fault. And no one should want to do that. <laughs> no one should want to do that. In my opinion. There are multiple ways to look at how to do YouTube or how to, book, how to do BookTube. I agree with that. In my opinion, these are conversations. And that something vital in terms of honesty, interpersonal honesty, is lost when they stop being that. But you, your mileage may vary, as the saying used to go. You might view BookTube in a purely mercantile sense. I don't, and I don't agree with BookTubers, for instance, who do view it that way, but lie about it. Hey, guys. How you doing, guys? Well, this is, you know, this is totally informal for me. I'm just a goofball. I'm just a big goofball. You know, I'll leave that in. I'm not going to edit that out. I'll, I, I'll, I'll see you in the comments field, but I wouldn't go to, unless my lawyer told me that I had to, I wouldn't go to my comments field. You want to look at it as a mercantile expense, as a mercantile exercise, sure. I'd appreciate it if these people didn't lie about it, and all of them do, with, you know, the goofy exterior that I'm just the kid down the block. I'm actually a multimillionaire, and I would sue you if you even said hello to me in Washington Square. But nevertheless, leaving them aside, and, and <laughs> I'm supposed, I want to add in the note that there are valid contrasting ways to look at how to do YouTube. But I don't think there's a valid contrasting way to look at the business of being voluntarily co-opted by an algorithm. You want to get popular at YouTube. You want it to be a valid paycheck. You maybe even want it to be your profession. Fine. Are we willing to say that if you view, if you have that view of YouTube instead of my view, the conversational view, are we willing to say that if you have that other view, anything goes? You can act like an algorithm. You can lie your ass off. I don't know that I'm willing to do that. There are varying ways to look at BookTube, uh, but that's not valid. That would be invalid even if BookTube doesn't exist. That that is you sacrificing everything for money, uh, which I don't agree with. <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, my two cents worth for this whole book talk reaction, this is an old subject, this, this kind of thing. These people are degrading the idea of what it is to be a reader. That kind of uh, hobby gatekeeping has been going on forever. I've been a victim of it as much as anybody. I've had many, many real readers say that I am not one unless I adhere to whatever they think is, is is what a real reader does. I have been a victim of the no true Scotsman fallacy many, many times myself. Nevertheless, I agree with a lot of the points that Barry Pierce makes in that GQ article. I'll see if I can leave a link to it that isn't paywalled. Uh, and I find it funny that a lot of the huge booktubers who have been decrying it are guilty of the crimes that are enumerated in the article. I can't help but think that's not a coincidence. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I'm curious to know if you've ever watched Book Talk, but I don't advise it. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to wrap this up just now, the BookTube response video, and I'll leave a link to as many va uh, relevant things as I can. I'm afraid I'm not going to link to a BookTuber with more than 200,000 subscribers. I'm simply not going to do it. Uh, it, it now, I know that you that you all know that it's not even a tacit encouragement on my part, but I'm simply, I can't do it. I can't do it. I have not found a BookTuber at that level that doesn't set off exactly the visceral reactions that I was talking about earlier in this video, which is that you're simply lying to me. You're simply lying to me. I don't believe that you do any of the things you say you do on this channel. I'm not going to link to people like that, but I'll gladly link to Toasty Towns and also to the GQ article. And we'll see what you think of the whole thing. Uh, so I'll wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.